Altogether, there are seven lakes on this property, and this one is called Chalky Pool. It's one of the smallest of the lakes here, and at this spot, the reed mace grows beautifully, heavy with pollen at this time of the year. Only later, towards autumn, does it take on that typical appearance of what most people call bulrushes. Alex grows a lot of trees hereabouts, and in consequence, the place is a great favourite with many arboreal birds. He gets woodpeckers here, and a lot of the smaller singing birds as well, like the chiffchaff. They go on singing now until well into the autumn, when most of them leave us for the winter. And here is one of his seedling little fir trees, and beneath it, a tiny frog. At a time when frogs are getting very scarce indeed, it's good to know they still breed here in appreciable numbers. When Alex first came here, there were only two legs. He's developed it up to the point of having seven. Some nice fungus there growing on dead timber, and it's near the dead timber that we hope to find the stag beetle, because the larvae of this formidable-looking insect actually lives in dead wood, a little grebe. They produce round about three broods a year on the big lakes here as a rule. Now, I'm not a dog man myself, but I'm told by people who profess to know that only Alsatians and their mongrels bite the water in this curious way. This big dog, Butch, must be the terror of poachers for miles around. The orchids love this damp soil around here, and there's quite a variety in their proper season. Spotted orchis there. Well, Alex has imported some Japanese larches, which grow very quickly indeed, and in the space of seven years, from about 1959, his Japanese larches have gone right up to about 30 feet high and left behind the Scotch firs alongside. And at this point, there's a very big old dead tree, which I decided to search very carefully through my glasses. And here at last, I found the thing we'd hoped to see, the stag beetle. This, of course, the male. They generally say when they come out this time of the year, it's a sign of fine hot weather. So I hope that's true. We could do with some. Well, it was then that Alex drew my attention to this so-called uncatchable trout, living in a little arm of the home pool, a pool that's not been stocked these two years past. Some willow herb beside this pool is the food plant of the elephant hawk moth, a rather reddish insect, quite a large moth, though not one of the largest of our hawk moths. And you may well see these about in the south, where there's willow herb, a tall, reddish, flowered plant that's so plentiful in many parts. Blue tits have their nest down a pipe. A lot of people ask me why or how tits ever manage to get their young out of a vertical pipe if the nest is right down in the bottom of it. The answer is, of course, the young crawl up inside. They have very, very sharp claws that enable them to do this. Well, Alex invited me to have a go at this allegedly uncatchable trout, a big fish that lives in that far arm of the home pool. And he said a lot of people had tried to catch it, but it had no luck at all, because the trout had been there a very long time and had got used to all the artificial flies. So it seemed to me my one chance would be to try and deceive it with something it had never seen before, and I put my faith in a bear hook, just a little bit of wire on it to make it sink and suggest the thorax of a nymph. Pied wagtails there, they've had a nest near one of Alex's rearing pools and now brought off their young. The house martins still busy with their young farther along under the eaves. Well, I was rather encouraged by the fact that while I'd been wiring that hook, I had seen or thought I'd seen a fish move somewhere over at that far end of the home pool. And as I approached, sure enough, the fish rose again and I was very encouraged by the size of this trout. Well, it seemed to me if I was going to get this fish, I'd probably have to go first time. And very, very carefully, I cast under the low overhanging trees. And suddenly I saw the fish turn towards my nymph, saw its mouth open as it took, and had no difficulty at all in setting the hook. 
It was then that my difficulties really began because the fish ran very hard indeed down into that arm and of course I was much hampered by the trees and had the greatest difficulty in managing to uh, keep the tight line without having it foul against the tree trunks and snap. At last I managed to get the fish on a fairly short line and then I had to hold him and take the steam out of him without my rod tip fouling the branches overhead and this again presented me with many problems. This I noticed was a brown trout, a big brown, probably been in that pool for some years and had grown on from a very, very tiny fish that had first been turned in there. One of the last of the fish left in this pool, I imagine, and certainly by the size of him, one of the biggest. And of course a fish like this is very strong and fights long and hard. Back in April I had a fish in this pool that weighed three pound four, and that one took me 12 minutes to bring to the net. Well this one was appreciably bigger and was taking even longer to subdue. Fish fighting mostly on the surface, not making a lot of attempt to get down into weed. It's that that can often defeat you at this time of the year when the weed growth is thick in the water. But of course, although he wasn't running away from me, he was giving me the very devil of a job to get him over my big net. At last, we succeeded, and I have an idea I was as tired as the fish himself when I finally got him out. And I really think this is the most beautiful brown trout I've ever caught anywhere. Not perhaps quite the biggest, but certainly the best conditioned, the strongest and deepest. His weight, three pounds, 15 and a half ounces. Call him 315. And I'll say goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>